When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to begin a study tonight in the letter of Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippians. The title of the message tonight is A Poor But Precious Church. A Poor But Precious Church. Philippians chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 11 tonight. And um, we're going to be focusing more on the, the preciousness of this church than on their poverty in this letter in particular. But we find out Paul speaks more about the poverty of the Philippians in his second letter to the, to the Corinthians. And actually, he uses them as a challenge to the Corinthians, which were fairly influential. They were wealthy. And he's saying the Philippians basically are out giving you. And there's, they, they're living in extreme poverty, and they're out giving you. And so he's challenging the Corinthians, and he talks about the poverty of this church, but you're going to also see in this letter the preciousness of this church, the church at Philippi. But th these Philippians have a a very special place in Paul's heart. We'll look at tonight about why that is as we go into this letter. Now this is one of four prison epistles, what we call prison epistles, that Paul wrote while he was in prison. What are the other three? You have Philippians, what are the other three prison epistles? Ephesians, Colossians, what's the other one? It's always the hardest to remember. Philemon. Philemon. There you go. It's a personal letter that Paul sends. So this is one of four prison epistles written from the city of Rome. And there's some, there's some discussion about if Paul is in prison, possibly at Ephesus or maybe at Caesarea for a two-year period of time. But as you, as you look at some of the details of this letter and the events and the context of the things that he says, it appears that all of the prison epistles were written from Rome around 60 to 62 A.D. So the maybe uh, five or six years before the Apostle Paul is going to be executed. But he's there in Rome. He's in prison for a period of time. He's going to be released, but then he's going to have a second imprisonment, and that's whenever he's going to be executed. So Philippians is written from Rome by the Apostle Paul around 60 to 62 A.D. Now, Philippi, the city of Philippi, has a very rich history. And I just want to emphasize this because the Bible is not, we emphasize this all the time, the Bible is not mythology. Okay, the Bible and the scriptures that we have, they are recordings of true historical events in, in true historical places. Now, Philippi was named after a man named Philip II of Macedonia. Now, who was Philip II of Macedonia's son? Anybody remember? 
What's that? Alexander the Great. So this city is named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip II of Macedonia. This is also, so that's kind of where the, this uh, city, where, what it dates back to. So it's about uh, 400 years before Christ is when this city was founded. It's around the time of Philip and Alexander the Great. But, but the city also has, is the site of a very major Roman battle in 42 B.C. So this is the, it's the site of a, of a major Roman battle in 42 B.C. where Antony and Octavian defeated Brutus, if those names sound, possibly sound familiar. I think Octavian's, what was his other name? I'm hitting you all with a lot of history questions tonight. What was his other name? If I, and I'm going this off my memory, so I'm going to have to correct this next week. What else did he go by, Octavian? Was he also Augustus? I think so. Anyway, we'll, we'll see next week. But if you notice the name Brutus, you ever hear of a guy named Julius Caesar? Okay, so these, these are connections. I mean, strong connections to very important times in history. So there was a battle there in 42 B.C. Antony and Octavian defeated Brutus and Cassius. And that, I'll tell you how significant that is. is that, that spells the end of the Roman Republic. That ends the Roman Republic and ushers in the Roman Empire. After 42 B.C., the city of Philippi, a lot of those who fought in that battle are a lot of the, the, the retired military guys who fought in that battle uh, settled there in the city of Philippi. And this is very significant. It's going to tie into some other things we're going to read tonight, that Philippi becomes a Roman colony. And that's a big deal. Basically, when I say it's a Roman colony, it means that in a lot of ways, Philippi was like an extension of Rome. It was, it was um, almost like a, an outpost or an extension of Rome itself. Philippians were not, I'll put it this way, Philippians were not Roman subjects. They were Roman citizens. The Jews there in Palestine, they were Roman subjects. Rome ruled over them. But those at Philippi were Roman citizens. Even though they were born in Philippi, they were born in this, in this area of, of Greece, Macedonia, they were considered Roman citizens, which was a big deal. This was a distinguished honor and really a source of pride for the city. That's what the city was really known for, was that they were recognized as a Roman colony. But we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1 tonight. Did you look it up, Justin? to see. Okay, all right. So, man, I had to really test my memory there. But uh, I'll, I'll say this. So Octavian is the one who, who ushers in the Roman Empire, and it was in the days of Caesar Augustus that Jesus is going to be born 42 years after, um, after those events, after that, that war that took place and the Roman Empire was established, which changes the, the history of the world. That's how significant that event is and that, that happened in that battle there at Philippi. But if we will stand in honor of God's Word tonight as we read Philippians chapter 1, Beginning in verses 1 through 5, a poor but precious church. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you, for you all, making requ requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Let's Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, for this time together tonight. Father, it is such a privilege to be able to open your word, to be able to study it, and to learn, and to grow. And God, it is just, it really is a, a limitless gold mine of information and of instruction, of wisdom. God, it's amazing how you have constructed your word, how the, you have used these different men and circumstances, world events, empires, all these different things, God. We see that these are really um, just pieces in the puzzle that you have you've put together that we're able to look at 2,000 years later, look back upon and see how you were working and moving in all these different situations. And God, it's, it's amazing to think about and it's exciting to be a part of. And I pray, God, that we would see that tonight, that we'd see the excitement and the, and the joy of serving you and really what we've been called into, God. No matter what any of us do outside of this place, what we do, what we may accomplish in our workplaces or in our careers or, or you know, 
or in uh, what we might do financially, like that, all of that is really meaningless compared to to the the glory that we've been called into here as believers, as part of this church. God, as we are your children, as we are your witness and a, a lot for you, ambassadors for you here in this world. And God, that is so significant. We want to be the best ambassadors that we can possibly be. We want to know as much as we possibly can. And God, that's why we're going through these studies, going through letter by letter, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because God, we don't want to miss anything. We want to see everything that can be seen there in your word. And God, we just want to continually be mining out this goal that you have prepared for us, Lord. And we want to be able to use it, God, recognizing that it's more, it's, it's worth more than anything. It's worth more than a winning lottery ticket. It's worth more than any precious jewels that are going to, they're going to perish when this life is over. But God, these are eternal riches that you've entrusted us. And so God, we pray that we would see them as that, would value them as that, and that God, you would help us, God, to really just seize the opportunity, God, that you've placed before us and the calling that you've placed before us. We thank you, Lord, for this time together tonight, and we pray your blessing upon this time of our of the message tonight and also of our time of discussion. God, and we just pray and ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. So I'll stop right there kind of mid-sentence. He's thanking God for them for, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So what's the history here? What's the history of the relationship between Paul and the Philippians? We have to go back about 12 years before this letter is being written. A lot has transpired. You go back 12 years to Paul's second missionary journey. If you remember, Paul and Barnabas went on his first missionary journey. But they got ready to go back again, and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and Paul wasn't having it. He disagreed, and so they split up. It was so, there was such a fierce disagreement, they split up. Uh, Barnabas and Mark went one direction, and Paul and Silas went the other. We, we sang tonight, it was interesting, in the song about Paul and Silas, and, and that song, Stand By Me, and we're going to look at that tonight. You go back 12 years, you go back to Paul's second missionary journey, with Silas, Luke is with him as well. And we have a lot of detail about this, as he says in verse 5, this first day, this initial introduction. If you turn up back in Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16 beginning in verse 6, I want you to listen to how this relationship formed, how this church came into existence. We're going, to, we're going to rewind before the writing of this letter, go back 12 years to Paul's second missionary journey. Some very fascinating things are contained in this chapter. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6, it says this. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. That's fascinating itself. The Holy Ghost says you're not going to Asia. Verse 7. After they were in Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So they're hitting these roadblocks. I don't know what this looks like, but the Holy Spirit is, whether it's providentially, whether it's just uh, His impression upon them that they are not to go to these places, the Holy Spirit is stopping them from going to these places where they were planning to go to share the gospel. Verse 8. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. So Paul, you know, he wakes up from this vision, from this dream, and immediately he says, I have the answer. I know where we need to go. We're going to Macedonia. And you notice that these we statements means that who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, right? So as, as you see, you know, when it talks about them or they, Luke is not with them. But in this passage, in Acts chapter 16, we're seeing a lot of statements about we, which means that Luke is with Paul and Silas. So, so Paul says, I have the answer. We're going to Macedonia to preach the gospel in the name. Verse 11, the Lord is, that's where the Lord is sending us. Verse 11, therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with, with straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. 
which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and, listen to what it says, and a colony. That's very significant. And we were in that city abiding certain days. So that's how they make it there. That's, that is how... Um, that is how the gospel arrives there. It begins with a dream, with a vision. Now this is a momentous occasion. It doesn't really sound like it here. It's, they didn't really travel a, a great distance. But what just took place in those verses we just read is that the gospel has jumped a continent. Up to this point, they've been in the Middle East, which is part of Asia, the continent of Asia. Now they're going to Europe. They've just jumped a continent, going there into Greece, going there into Macedonia. They've now, it's now transcontinental from Asia into Europe. This church at Philippi was the first Christian church Paul planted in Europe. That's very significant. Where do you come from? Friendsville? Um... Look at your skin. Let me, let me look at everyone's skin here. Where do you come from? Yep. I think Cheryl Moneymaker is our only Native American at this church. Um, you're not from here. Where are you from? Where's your ancestry go back to? We're all Europeans. My skin is very different from Jesus's. I'm not Middle Eastern. Our skin will look very different. But... The gospel, which was a, which, the events of which brought about the gospel, Christ, what he did there in Jerusalem, his, his death on the cross, his resurrection, that good news, the Jewish Messiah, his gospel got to me, even though I'm of European descent living in North America, his gospel got to me. I, I think that's a big deal. Maybe you don't, but I think it's a big deal. When I see that they're in Europe, I'm thinking, hey, that's where I come from. That's important. This is not a Middle Eastern religion. This is not an African religion. This is a global religion. This is for all of humanity. We see that just in those few verses. We're coming on to verses 13 through 15. So what happens when they arrive there? I mean, there's some things that have built up to this. I mean, God obviously, Christ obviously wants them there in the city of Philippi. So what's going to happen when they get there? Verse 13. And on the Sabbath, that's significant, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake to the women which resorted thither. Well, what was Paul's usual course of action? When he went into a city, where's the first place he went to, especially on the Sabbath? That means Jewish people, right? Where's the first place he went to? Synagogue. synagogue. He didn't go to the synagogue. Why not? There's not a synagogue. Not in Philippi. He goes out to the, to the, near this river where women are meeting, Jewish women are meeting and praying. That tells you that there's a very, very small Jewish population. In order to have a synagogue, you had to have 10 Jewish men, uh, 10 um, heads of households, 10 Jewish men who are heads of their household. Obviously, they did not have that, even that small a number of Jewish population there in the city of Philippi. So they're going out to this river. That's where the, the Jewish population is gathering, maybe just a handful of women there going out by this river and praying, praying to Yahweh, praying to God. Verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which are spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she, brought, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. You see that in verse 14, whose heart the Lord opened. That ties right into what I was saying this morning. That's a miracle. A supernatural miracle that Lydia's heart was opened. She received the gospel. She became a Christian that day. She was baptized in her household. And she's, she is... She besought Paul and Silas and Luke to come to her house. That is where most likely where the, the church was planted there at Philippi, was in her house. She's a wealthy woman. She's a seller of purple, which was, that was really seen as for the higher classes in Roman society. 
And so she was dealing in, in those types of circles, but she's born again supernaturally. She's saved. She's born again. The Lord opens her heart to receive the gospel. She's saved, and most likely that is where her house would be probably the only area for the church there that would be big enough for them to be able to meet. Um, and so there, it's a house church where they're beginning to meet there at Philippi. Verses 16 through 18. It says, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So there's this slave girl who is demonically possessed, and she's basically a fortune teller, and they, her, her masters, her owners are using that to make money. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show up unto us the way of salvation. Now, is that true? Is that who they are? That's a factual statement. So she is following them around. And it says, but this, um, verse 18, and this she did many days. So it, this is, she's, she's yelling these things. We don't know if she's saying it, she's not saying it sincerely, but we don't know if, if she's mocking them or, or how she's saying this, but she is harassing them, following them around. And it, this is not the endorsement you want. You don't want an, an endorsement from a demonically possessed girl saying that, that it is unrepentant, she's not saved, she's possessed by a demon, and she's saying these things about, about Paul and Silas and Luke, that these be the servants of the Most High God, was showing us the way of salvation. Finally, Paul has enough of it. It says, But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So this demon is cast down. This demon is exercised. You notice here that they're first met. This idea of the gospel spreading into Europe. We notice there's opposition. They first meet with spiritual, demonic opposition and harassment. Spiritual warfare taking place behind the scenes that always seems to occur first, but then you start seeing things happening more outwardly. We come down to verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying... Listen to what they say. Listen to the accusation. These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs that are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, what does it say? Being Romans. That's the magic word. At Philippi, the fact that they are part of a Roman colony, that they have Roman citizenship, is everything to them. And when they hear that, they're, that they are preaching and teaching things contrary to Roman law, that they have an anti-Roman message, that's all they needed to hear. Verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ripped their clothes off, commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So this has really taken a turn. You begin to think back to how did they get here? Well, the Lord spoke to them in a dream. A man of Macedonia, this vision, this dream, which they interpreted to be from the Lord. But man, we're seeing that it's not going so well. But you know, that's where Jordan, I'd be, I would be saying, we've made a mistake. We shouldn't even be here. Obviously, you know, we thought God was in this. Lydia was saved, her household. We thought, you know, God was moving. I'm sure I would start questioning what we had done up to this point. Are we even, should we even be here right now? But that's not what Paul and Silas do. Let's look at verse 25. How do they respond? They know God wants them there. Even though they've been beaten, they've been stripped, they've been beaten, they've been thrown into prison, they're now shackled in the center of the prison, or like, kind of like a, a dungeon, they know that God wants them to be there, that they've been led to that moment. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. They're still praying. Their faith is not wavering at all. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly... There was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. 
The keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Listen to what he says here. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of that night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all, and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. That's an amazing story. Another miracle. You know, this man is inches away from death. He's inches away from death, seconds away from suicide, and not just suicide, but hell. And miraculously, he has stopped, and he's saved. That's an amazing thing to think about. Yeah, I love that story. I think, of, I think it was Spurgeon maybe that made the statement about, you know, Christianity is the religion for a man with a, with a, with a sword in his own throat. If you could just tell him about Christ. You know, if you went up to this man and said, let me tell you about the five pillars of Islam, he's going to kill himself. But Christ can stop it sovereignly right in his tracks and say, there's still hope. Don't push that sword. Don't pull that trigger. That's the hope we have in Christianity. Inches away, seconds away from suicide, from hell, from separation from God forever. And then suddenly a miracle happens. He stopped. He's saved. His entire eternal destiny changes this night. And he knows it. And he's rejoicing about it there in verse 34. Come on down to verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. So what you see here is that they weren't... This was really an emotional thing. Whenever they, um, you know, whenever they, they charged them, as soon as they heard that they're teaching anti-Roman, you know, this is anti-Roman propaganda, they're immediately emotionally charged. They tear their clothes off. They beat them. The next day they've calmed down. They say, okay, let's let those men go. Verse 35. The keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned. What's the next thing he says? Being Romans. And have cast us into prison, and now they do thrust us out privately? Nay, or no, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Huh. He thought we were anti-Roman. We were, we, were, we were Jewish men pushing anti-Roman propaganda. We are Roman. You've beaten Romans without a trial. You come get us yourself. Paul and Silas, both, Barnabas was a Jew. Paul and Silas are both Roman. They're, they're both Roman citizens themselves. That's the worst thing that the leaders there at Philippi, that's the worst thing they could ever hear. We just beat. It's all, about, it's all about being citizens of Rome. Well, you just beat citizens of Rome. And if you're not careful, the entire Roman Empire is going to come and take away your colony, take away your place. And so now they're trembling. Verse 18, And the sergeants told those words to the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them or begged them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. Again, that's probably where the, the, the local church is now, suddenly, miraculously. Entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and then they departed. That was the first day. From the first day until now, that's what Paul's referring back to 12 years earlier. That was Paul's time there at Philippi. He visits the city probably two other times during his third missionary journey. But we'll say this. Suffice it to say, Philippi is a pretty rough place to be a Christian. It's a pretty rough place to preach the gospel. But 12 years later, they're still standing. And Paul's writing them this letter because they're still standing. And that's why Paul is praying for them every day. 
You know, Paul's body probably still bore scars from his time at Philippi. He probably had scars on his back. He could have said, I got those at Philippi. But he rejoiced and was still rejoicing and praying for them every day. And he was joyful and confident in spite of the opposition. You see, Paul had found lifelong partners in the gospel. In his mind, I'm sure it was worth a beating and a night in jail. He had, he had found lifelong partners in the gospel. The Philippians stood by Paul until the day he died. Lifelong partners. That's hard to find today. I want to read a letter to that church because that's not around today. Yeah, I'll, you know, we're going to try this endeavor. We'll, um, we'll do this for a year, maybe two years. But people today in our culture do not make lifelong commitments. Even when they do make them, they break them. I have some respect for these who said, Paul, we're going to support you till the day you die. They were co-workers in the gospel for the rest of Paul's life. And we see that in verses 6 through 11 as we close tonight. Paul is still confident and he's joyful about what God is doing. Being confident of this very thing. So he's praying for them. He's been praying for them from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even if it is meet or necessary for me to think of this, think this of you all because I have you in my heart and as much as both in my bonds and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. You know, the Philippians sent a man to Paul. This is how, this is how much they supported him. They were continually helping fund his ministry. Even though they, they were financially very poor, they, were, they, were, they had extreme living within extreme poverty, they were continually supporting him financially, helping him financially. And not only that, but we're going to see in this letter that they had sent a man to him named um, Epaphroditus. And basically they were sending him on their dime to say, whatever Paul needs, we're sending you for this purpose. You go take care of Paul in prison. Now, Epaphroditus almost dies on the way there. And so Paul is going to send him back because he's, he was at the point of death. He's recovered enough where he can travel again. So Paul is sending him back. But basically the church, they entrusted, they were so connected with Paul, they said, we're going to pull our money together. We're going to send a man there to do what? Whatever Paul needs. That's what we're going to send you to do. And so Paul's going to send him back with this letter, carrying this letter, to report back to them and to explain why he's sending him back and thanking them for how that they are their partners together in this gospel work. Paul is saying basically this. You know, they kicked me out of Philippi. We read that just a few moments ago. They, they were begging us to depart. They beat us, they imprisoned us, they, and they asked us to, to leave town. They kicked me out. But Paul recognizes he is not the one who began a good work in the Philippians. You see, Paul knows he didn't open Lydia's heart. He didn't save the jailer in his household. It is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who began the work and he'll finish it. That's the confidence that Paul has, even in the face of opposition, hostility, and adversity. And they cannot kick him out of town. The Holy Spirit is there, and he's not going anywhere. Paul is praying for their continued growth in love and in discernment and humility and in unity. We're going to see that as we continue on through the letter. Paul recognizes, and we're going to, we'll, we'll close with this, that this church is a miracle. It was miraculously and supernaturally conceived and born, and it has been miraculously and supernaturally sustained, and it's still alive to that day, still standing through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, miraculously and supernaturally. This church is still alive and well, as Paul writes to them. 
And Paul is telling them, you're not done yet. They're standing, but they've not yet begun to fight. He's going to warn them in this letter that false teachers are coming. As he refers to them as enemies of the cross are coming. And Paul wants them to be ready. That's why he's saying he wants them to have this love, this unity, this humility, as he's going to talk about in chapter 3. But he says that I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent. That term approve means to prove things. It's like to, to test metal to see is it really gold or is it counterfeit. He's saying, I want you to, in love, I want you to increase in knowledge. I want you to be perceptive. I want you to be razor sharp because false teachers are coming and I want you to be ready. We're going to close with that tonight.